Well, for everybody on the phone, uh, good morning and welcome to another edition of the Metal COVID-19 Business Assistance Webinar Series. My name is Jason Smith and I'm President and CEO of the Manhattan Area Chamber of Commerce. Many of you have been on previous calls, but for those of you not familiar with Metal, Metal is a regional coalition of the Manhattan, Emporia, Topeka, and Lawrence Chambers of Commerce. Metal was formed because the leadership of these four chambers felt there was a need for a regional voice for business, and we believe that the four metal chambers represent an important voice in the middle. In addition to many common interests, the Metal Coalition represents nearly 3,000 Kansas businesses. Our motto is stronger together, and together is exactly how we're going to get through this challenging time. So with that, let's get into today's topic, which is recovery in a post-COVID world. We're pleased to have Jeff Finkel, President and CEO of the International Economic Development Council with us today. As President and CEO of the International Economic Development Council, Jeff is a recognized leader and authority on economic development. He has held top positions with IEDC and its predecessor for over 30 years. Today, IEDC is the world's largest economic development membership organization and is a $5 million annual operation that is renowned for its leadership in professionalizing and diversifying the field of economic development. Jeff previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary in the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and has received numerous awards over the years for his commitment to making sustainable economic development a priority in communities of all sizes. A frequent lecturer and author of numerous articles, Jeff has appeared on CBS Sunday Morning, Fox Television, and the Journal Report on PBS. Uh, on a personal note, I've, I've been a member of IEDC for 20 years. Uh, I have been uh, certified by IEDC since 2004, uh, and I say this with, with a lot of love. I think the worst job in the world would be leading an organization run by economic developers. So I give Jeff a ton of credit for being able to, to put up with us for over 30 years and, and, and does an outstanding job. So Jeff, thanks for being with us today, and I will now turn over today's, today's uh, program to you. Well, Jason, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, but I will tell you, I think I have one of the best jobs in the world. Um, I, um, I think you're tougher on economic developers than you need to be. I, I, I've been pleased to work with as many people that are passionate about working with their communities trying to grow their local economies and trying to help people find jobs. I think for many of our members, it's almost religious-like in terms of what they do, the passion they share, and uh, what they set out to do every day. I'm also fortunate uh, to have somebody from uh, Kansas serve on my board of directors, and Molly Howie is uh, is on my board and, and she's uh, uh, invited me to participate in today and I, I'm appreciative of that. I, I have about 12 slides, but uh, before I go into the slides, I think I'm gonna uh, step back and, and take a, uh, in some cases, a, a slight deviation from those slides and, and also discuss some of the things that we are seeing. Um, so let me start with some headlines. Headline number one, today, uh, the Economic Development Administration of the U.S. Department of Commerce is announcing that they uh, have their notice of funds availability for $1.5 billion uh, to help uh, communities deal with the economic aftermath of the coronavirus. Uh, that is the largest amount of money that I've ever seen come out of EDA in my 30 plus years of, of watching EDA. I, I believe you guys work out of the uh, Denver office, if I'm not mistaken, and they will be assigned some subset of that $1.5 billion. So you should think about uh, what you might have that could be a fundable project uh, that EDA can assist you with at this particular time. One of the things I would provide some personal advice to you is don't think long-term economic development uh, for that 1.5 billion because I, uh, is my 
estimation that the government across the board is trying to see as many people reemployed as quickly as possible, as many businesses uh, being started up as quickly as possible. So think about how you could use EDA money to support uh, businesses that might be struggling. Um, we had, um, IEDC is having a series of, of salons this week, as we're calling them. And we had uh, Jim Golub, a, a former consultant with uh, the Stanford Research Institute, or SRI. And we were talking about how do you save the tourism industry at this particular time. And we talked about import substitution. So as you're thinking about your potential EDA application, think about how you can retrain people in industries that might be hard pressed to recover quickly and think about those businesses that also would lose market share and what else could they be doing at this particular time or as I, uh, the term I used a minute ago, import substitution. Headline number two, uh, if you're not using a website called RestoreYourEconomy.org, uh, you're probably missing out on a great resource. RestoreYourEconomy.org is actually written and managed by the International Economic Development Council. Um, I don't spend a lot of time with it, but I would say it's partly uh, I, uh, my baby. Uh, I convinced the Economic Development Administration in about 2006 or 2007 uh, after Katrina to uh, help fund uh, setting up a website that helps communities deal with economic recovery after disasters. If you got hit by a tornado, a hurricane, a wildfire, an earthquake, um, you know, some massive flooding of some sort, uh, before the first middle of March, uh, you would have found a lot of relevant information on how to recover after that. Starting in mid-March, IEDC put a ton of effort in there to deal with the coronavirus or COVID-19. Today, uh, sometime after about three o'clock, and, and much of this exists already on the website, we're gonna be announcing that there's a fair amount of resources and tools on how to reopen your local economy. Um, we've got uh, industry reopenings from retail to airlines, uh, to restaurants, sports and entertainment industries. Uh, and we've gone around and collected a fair amount of information from a variety of, of uh, associations, industry groups, and we're trying to help our economic developers think through some of the steps that they're gonna have to do to help get their economy restarted. And you'll find a fair amount of information uh, at that website at this particular point. Um, third, if you haven't been listening to IEDC's webinar series, we started the webinar series, I believe approximately February, or, um, excuse me, March 17th. And we've had at least one free webinar dealing with the coronavirus uh, every week since then, sometimes two a week. You can also find all the recordings of those uh, at restoreyoureconomy.org or at the International Economic Development Council website. Today at uh, 4.30 Eastern Standard Time and tomorrow at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time, we will have episodes four and five of what we're calling salons. And we've had upwards of 60 to 70 people uh, using the Zoom platform. So, there's a, a variety of economic development issues that have been discussed uh, through these salons. So those are kind of the uh, major things that I wanted to talk about. No, let me go to uh, headline number four, I believe. And that is, what is Congress gonna do next in terms of a, uh, what I think will probably be their final bite at the apple. I could be wrong by that. 
um, and what will they do to help the nation recover from the coronavirus? And I believe that that is going to deal with the state and local government bailout. You've, if you're watching the national news, you're certainly seeing that uh, play out. Um, but there's also an economic development uh, subscript to what is uh, being debated and talked about at this particular point in time. And while our state and local governments are having difficult financial issues, and I'm anticipating a five to $600 billion um, subsidy bailout, whatever you wanna call it for state and local government, I believe, or at least um, I'm hoping, there will be something in there for economic developers as well. Because as we've done some surveying of economic developers across the country, we're finding two things. We're finding that those who rely on private sector contributions are in some cases having a difficult time maintaining that support. And if they're relying upon local government, they're having a difficulty maintaining that support. So we are focused in two particular areas. As many of you know, the federal government passed a thing called the Payroll Protection Plan or otherwise the 7A loan guarantee or 7A program. And they used, uh, they called it the PPP. It was available for for-profit businesses and 501c3s. It did not uh, address the needs of 501c6s C5s or C4s. And uh, so we have been working on the Hill to try to uh, resolve the issue, particularly for C6s. C5s are unions, and I forget what C4s are. Um, but uh, we believe that there is a reasonable chance that C6s will be put in whatever next bill occurs but we also know that the Senate and the House will need to add money to uh, meet the needs because the, uh, the PPP will be out of money in their second tranche uh, by the time the Congress gets around to approving this uh, uh, next bailout bill. The second thing that IEDC is working on is we're trying to find an, another uh, uh, pot of money for to come up with the shortfalls that many of the economic developers are likely to experience as a result of uh, weak local government uh, financing and many of their businesses being in trouble. Um, my number that I'm trying to uh, talk people into is a billion dollars. And, and frankly, uh, our backstop, if we can't get that, is at least if there is a state and local government uh, bailout, that there is some language in there that encourages local governments to fund, fully fund economic development organizations and their public-private partnerships. So let me uh, spend a couple minutes talking about this uh, presentation uh, that I, you have in front of you, me, or in front of you, excuse me. Uh, it's recovery in a, in a post-COVID world. Um, let me see, let me make sure that I actually, there we go, am controlling uh, this uh, slide presentation. Sometimes these things are easier said than done. And when I finally get it, there we go, it'll probably advance four slides really quickly. So there are three phases of recovery. Uh, one is mobilization. Second, preparation to reopen safely and securely. And third is to position your community uh, for long-term recovery. And that is, uh, those three things are, are kind of consistent, whether it was a flood or uh, the uh, COVID uh, virus or corona or COVID-19. Um, many organizations or many communities determine a lead organization when they're thinking about economic recovery. Frankly, uh, th this uh, does 
uh, we do have some problems when it's a broad ranging uh, economic recovery like we're probably experiencing here and that every mayor, every county wants to have their own uh, economic recovery plan. They all want to have their own task force and it takes a well-disciplined community or region to say we're going to do this regionally. We're going to cooperate every step of the way. We saw some of that um, as the Northeast and Northwest states all decided that they're going to work together. But um, as they started to get um, pushed politically to reopen quickly, um, all uh, those communities or all those states started to look in a slightly different direction and some of their uh, willingness to coalesce and work together kind of fell apart. Um, one of the things that we know is that the uh, this COVID uh, pandemic will not impact all sectors of the community and the economy in quite the same way. You know, it is without question that your retail sector uh, will likely be hit hard. Your tourism sector will likely uh, struggle a great deal. Um, and there are probably uh, your education sector uh, could also be impacted for some period of time. But there are other sectors of your economy that may well do pretty good. Healthcare, now that uh, um, we're gonna go back to having uh, um, uh, surgeries for non-urgent activities, dental offices are starting to uh, uh, reopen uh, across the country. Veterinarians, I don't think, ever really uh, shut down. Many manufacturing plants uh, were considered essential and they didn't shut down. Uh, the, the whole notion, however, of, of meat processing has been a, a real problem across the country. I'm not sure why meat processing uh, plants seem to uh, have had taken on more coronavirus uh, patients than other places, but it certainly did. But I think as communities, we need to understand what our commodity, uh, community, but excuse me, what our economy was uh, prior to COVID-19, what are the assets for our recovery and what are gonna be the local uh, dynamics afterwards. There, there are certain places in the country I'm not sure I'd wanna be right now. Uh, vail, Colorado uh, has a, a, a large uh, tourism industry, the state of Maine, um, it makes a lot of their money during the summers as people um, head there for cool summers. Uh, so uh, places that are heavily reliant on tourism could, could be in, in trouble for some period of time. You know, communities are gonna have to think about what are those pain points. Uh, I think that one of the things this coronavirus showed is that we do have a broken supply chain. Uh, and now I would point that supply chain is broken, particularly in the healthcare industry. One of the questions that I've been asking, it's a kind of a rhetorical question, what if China had had four times the number of coronavirus patients than they did? Would we have gotten any pharmaceuticals? Would we have gotten any ventilators? Would we have gotten any PPE? And this time it is ventilators. The next uh, disease or virus could actually hit, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, kidney dialysis might be, uh, it might impact our kidneys. You know, should we as a country uh, rely on a, on our, for healthcare on a supply chain that is that spread out and that it is that much at risk? Is that not an issue of national security in a way that we need to ask our Congress to insist that we can have our pharmaceuticals uh, in, the, in the United States? Um, should we not be able to uh, generate PPE uh, effectively and quickly in the United States? And isn't there some um, particular types of uh, uh, medical devices that have to be made here in the United States? or at least have the ability to have some min minimal level and can grow to scale if we find ourselves in trouble. 
Um, in the same way, there were, we, we also probably found our supply chain was, was damaged for other uh, businesses as well. And we, I think we're going to have to look at that. I think there are many companies that are going to say, we need uh, our major suppliers located here, here in the United States. And I think there are many companies that are going to probably think about reshoring. You, know, you probably ought to be thinking about what those clusters are that you need to focus on and how that can help your community be less vulnerable uh, in the future. Um, the pandemic has certainly impacted workers. We've got, what, 33 million people out of work at this particular time. You know, before the 1st of March, all of us were talking about the shortage of employees. Now we're probably looking at an excessive number of employees that are available. Um, many of these folks will not be able to get back to work for a period of time. Uh, and how are we going to help them as economic developers, as uh, workforce providers as communities. It seems to me that we're going to have to do some significant work to help many of these people avoid losing their homes, losing their rental properties, losing their cars, ending up in homeless shelters, being able to feed themselves. That's part of the reasons the, the government gave us so much money um, is so that we do have some uh, facility uh, to support many of these people as they survive between jobs. And I think that is part of the reason that they plussed up unemployment benefits. I've heard the other side of the unemployment benefit argument that many people may not show up back to work because they get the extra money and it is probably more than they're uh, making in their existing job. But also many of these folks will not have a job to go back to. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. Um, and then we're going to have to think about how do we retrain many of these people for jobs that, that may have disappeared. There's certainly a, a commentary out there right now that we may have lost 50% of our large department stores uh, at this particular time. And what else did we lose to Amazon as they took over much of the retailing? Um, fair. Um, so, you know, we've got our work cut out for us. There are um, uh, businesses that uh, we need to figure out how to open up. And for those that may have joined late, I pointed out that RestoreYourEconomy.org now has a number of features talking about reopening. And uh, so we're going to have to understand which, uh, which small businesses do we think we need to go in and do triage, which will survive without our assistance. And unfortunately, uh, which of those uh, um, may go out of business and how can we help those owners uh, uh, leave the business uh, and not lose everything in the process. We've also got to make sure that our communities are safe. We've A uh, couple of the speakers that we've had in our own uh, series of, of webinars have talked about testing and tracing and isolating. Are we able to test enough people so that we know who has the virus? Um, can we isolate them so that they're not sharing that with others? And can we trace who they've been in touch with and prevent the uh, virus from uh, growing further in our communities? Until we get a vaccine, the only way we're gonna have successful reentry uh, into our communities is gonna be uh, testing, tracing, and isolating. Um, Reentry is going to be gradual. Uh, the good news in, in many parts of the country, the golf courses are open. Um, as somebody who pretends to be a golfer, I'm looking forward to that. And frankly, I think that's one of the best things for the golf industry, which has lost a, uh, a fair number of golfers over the last few years. Maybe we'll get more people to take up golf again. There's going to be a lot of work for economic developers, and that's part of the reason that I've been arguing uh, for more resources for economic development. We're going to have many uh, entrepreneurs distressed. We're going to have many uh, workers uh, distressed, and we're going to have to uh, partner with a whole variety of entities to make sure that we've got a full uh, bucket of tools to help our businesses and our workers in our community. Um, so the four keys to uh, 
reentry is health screening, temperature checks, uh, PPE, designing uh, reentry for social distancing, and, uh, and how can we help our businesses. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Jason, I'm, I would be happy to handle any questions that you might have for me. All right. Um, so I'll remind everybody, if you have questions, to type them into the uh, Q&A um, section of, of your Zoom. So I'll start with a question, uh, kind of broad question, but um, out of this crisis, for lack of a better word, do you see any large transformative initiatives, good or bad, that, that might come out of this and, and specifically you know, something related to education or something related to uh, energy or healthcare, or do you see any major initiatives that people are starting to think, wow, we need to, we need to really start uh, addressing these issues? Well, let me talk about some of the transformative things that have come out of this. And, and unfortunately, some of them probably aren't good for our communities and for the way we do business. For better or for worse, we just, many of us discovered we don't need the office space that we've uh, maintained. Will that impact our central business districts? Will, that, uh, will people decide that I do not need that expensive real estate office space that we currently maintaining? You know, I've got, uh, IEDC maintains a office space about a block and a half from the White House. For the most part, we have not had any employees there uh, for a month and a half, going on two months. We seem to have operated pretty well. Now, I frankly don't like the idea of giving up offices, but I'm, I may be a fuddy-dud. And uh, there will be a lot of business owners, there will be other associations, there'll be other people that said, we did just fine without it. We're gonna, and our lease is coming up next year and we're not gonna renew. Or uh, we're we gonna renew and we're going to uh, only take 25% uh, of the space that we had before. So I think we have to worry about what this has just done to our central business districts and and what that means to um, the price of commercial real estate. Second, um, I go back to a, a, a something I was just talking about. What does this mean uh, uh, to commercial space? We already had um, 100 regional malls essentially sitting empty across the country, and they've been um, uh, taking a big hit for the last several years. The coronavirus uh, caused many uh, more malls to uh, button up, shut down uh, for a period of time. If you if you read what I've been reading about the 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 the, the, uh, the big mall or um, excuse me the big department store, many of those may go the way of the dodo bird, and uh, and what's going to take those places of those. Uh, big department stores. Well, if it is something that brings a lot of people together, that may be a problem because until we can figure out how to tackle this virus and not get people sick by bringing them together, uh, that reuse may be a trouble. Uh, third, you know, will our arts industry, concerts, uh, big gatherings, theater, you know, how do we manage uh, our social distances or our six feet separation and not get people uh, sick in, in, in those things? And will we be watching more things via, um, via our computer screen? However, uh, the reverse of that is, will the old outdoor theater where you watched a movie in your car come back? I'm hearing that some uh, big malls are now thinking of ways to uh, pop up a big screen uh, of some sort, charge admission and show uh, movies outdoors again. Now that, uh, that is certainly old guard. Another thing that may happen, will this em implore 
many of our uh, manufacturers to rely more on uh, robots. You know, if, uh, if an employee couldn't show up or if an employee couldn't do it, can a robot do it? And, but that uh, is good for the company, but may, maybe not for reducing unemployment. Um, I'm sure I have some other thoughts, uh, Jason, but uh, those are the ones that uh, I, I would uh, throw at you right now. I gotcha. Um, so this is a similar question, but maybe there's something different. Um, what is the best opportunity for the new normal for our economy and how as chambers and EDOs do we take advantage of that? What is the new normal? I frankly don't know what the new normal is. Um, I don't think we have found the new normal. The, the new normal, if we came up with a, vi uh, with a vaccine by November, you know, the new normal might be we work more from home. Uh, but I, you know, I'm hoping the new normal will be more companies returning production capacity back to the United States. I'm not prepared to call it a trend. I'm not pre prepared that we should all get out our order books and, and start talking to site selectors about how many uh, companies they're bringing home. The, the new normal is probably months away. And I, I must tell you, um, you know, I follow trends as well as everybody else. I have not been on target at every, any step of the way. I didn't know how long we would be out. I didn't know when we would have to leave. I wouldn't uh, have anticipated uh, the difficulties uh, finding uh, treatment for the coronavirus, uh, uh, difficulty uh, dealing with vaccines, a difficulty dealing with testing, um, a difficulty finding PPE. So, um, and, and my guess is many of you probably uh, would have not guessed that all of these things would be as difficult. Unfortunately, I do not think as a country we've performed particularly admirably. I think there are other countries that have done much better at uh, dealing with many of these issues. Um, so how are we gonna deal with the next steps? And um, I, I don't have that new normal uh, handbook written yet, or nor have I read it. Okay. Are there any, have you seen any, or, or do you have thoughts about any low hanging fruit strategies that can be implemented immediately that gets the community back in a hopeful mode or, or back in a positive mode? Well, you know, um, part of that is leadership. And uh, I, I think in every community, if you have some optimistic leadership, if, uh, if they uh, frankly had a good local lender, uh, that help manage the PPP process for the local businesses. If people buy local, if people buy restaurant bonds, if people are uh, doing takeout at the existing uh, businesses that, um, you know, maybe not able to take uh, uh, and open up the, the restaurant yet, I think uh, those places are gonna be places that have a little bit more optimism. Those where they don't have a strategy or a plan to help support the existing businesses, um, it, it may be a little bit more difficult. I had an interesting conversation. I don't know if it was two weeks ago tomorrow or three weeks ago tomorrow. Front Royal, Virginia, not a terribly big place. It's uh, on the Western side of the state. They uh, came up with a million dollars, the, lo the uh, local community, and they are trying to figure out, and they will produce, and they're going to give a subsidy to every business in their community that has, holds a business license in Front Royal. They know there are, there are 500 businesses that have a, um, a business license. Don't you think that is a, a good sign for uh, optimism in that community, that that's how they're thinking? They actually asked my guidance or advice on how they should divide that money up, and I gave them uh, two or three ideas for formula. But the other thing is the, 
they're prohibited by d giving the full faith and credit of the local government to business. So they're given a grant to the uh, local chamber of commerce almost to do what they see fit. But then they were worried about the local chamber of commerce's ability to survive because many businesses weren't paying chamber dues. Well, I helped them say, well, why don't you give the chamber a contract uh, to spread that money around? I, I walked away with that just so impressed by the city of Front Royal that they were actually uh, thinking in those ways to, uh, to, to give everybody a pat on the back with a little cash uh, so they can help. Now, they also subtracted out some businesses. They figured out there were certain businesses that weren't going to need some assistance. So let's say that was 40 or 50. So there, that money went that much further. Great, great ideas. So I think uh, you're aware most of the communities or all the communities in metal ha are reliant and are influenced by higher education. Uh, do you think that uh, COVID-19 will impact the future of higher ed? For instance, will it, will it accelerate distance learning? Well, I think we were already there. Um, the Apollo group, uh, or what do they call it? Phoenix University um, in uh, Arizona, it, it really pushed that whole notion of distance learning uh, quite some way a few years ago. And, and that was followed by a number of other of the private sector players, Strayer and others. Um, you know, some of those players aren't as strong as they once were, you know, because frankly, they were encouraging students to, I'm not saying those particular companies, because I'm not a, a I have expertise in this, but uh, they were convincing students to take on too much debt and, um, and they kind of hurt the whole sector. But, um, you know, I think uh, we, we were there in terms of, of distance learning. I think many universities, virtually all universities, uh, turned to distant learning when they couldn't have uh, students safely in their classrooms. Um, and there will be probably more distant learning. However, I've taken courses in distance learning. I went to a four-year institution. I don't think there's a substitute. It's, it's uh, certainly ch possibly cheaper to do distance learning. And for some people, that will be an appropriate uh, uh, venue or way of going about it. But I think for many people, uh, returning to a traditional a uh, four-year institution is still going to be um, a desirable. Will this wash out a, a handful of colleges or universities? Maybe. Um, but they were also being hurt by the fact that they couldn't bring in international students, or at least were having a difficult time doing so. Uh, I, there may be some retrenchment for a variety of institutions. Okay. Along those lines, because we've noticed that this has been a challenge, um, particularly in, in university um, um, students trying to take from their homes. Do you see any movement or increase in priority for rural broadband based on more remote working? Um, I have not seen anything new. Uh, but I'm, if we all go all the way back to the uh, uh, stimulus uh, money in 2009, we've seen a fair amount of, of resources being directed at, at, at rural broadband. And I don't see that slowing up one iota. And I think uh, as we have all uh, gone to our respective homes, our respective corners, I think there's gonna be a real market demand that, uh, that our in internet backbone across the country, both urban and rural, has got to be stronger. You know, the fact that we cannot all participate on a Zoom call like this and have, uh, you know, somewhat seamless uh, ability to communicate tells me there's something wrong with our broadband. And so it, it's going to have to be solved rural. It's going to have to be solved inner urban, inner city urban. And they have many of the same problems of rural. That final mile is not being resolved in many places. Now, uh, I was talking to one of the deputy assistant secretaries at the Economic Development Administration, 
and they think they have uh, a more license to support uh, rural broadband or and, and urban broadband than they had before. I would hate to see EDA become just a broadband financing scheme. Um, we hope that other ex ex areas of commerce will continue to fund that and the Department of Agriculture Rural Development Program will continue to fund that and maybe Congress will find some additional funding. So we're not taking that money from direct economic development assistance. All right. Uh, I have a question from another one of your longtime members, Jack Halston, uh, who's who's in Pottawatomie County, and specifically, Jack wanted to talk about the beef and pork pack, packing industry and the supply chain issues you discussed, and now some pushback based on the profit margins of the very large companies and and people's desires, maybe not to help them through this process. And his question is, are there possibilities for animal science universities like KSU uh, to see if uh, there will be possibilities for smaller plants in the meat processing uh, to a couple hundred employees with more local ownership? Um, you know, Jack, I don't pretend to uh, be an expert in, in, in meat processing. I've been through a lot of facilities across the country and I've never been in a meat packing plant. Um, as a kid, uh, uh, my mother grew up on a farm and, and uh, we always would go to the meat market on Saturdays. But, uh, you know, as the, as the local butcher was cutting up uh, meat, he was doing it by himself. And uh, that's how we bought our meat. You know, I don't know if uh, there is an ability to uh, uh, reduce the size of these facilities and and be successful is um, part of the problem that we experienced here is the occupational health and safety standards were not very high or at least weren't very weren't being enforced. Now, if we uh, have an administration that actually enforces those, will that cause um, smaller facilities? And, and uh, but it, there's gotta be a market intervention of some sort that's gonna uh, require that to happen. A backlash from the customers, a backlash from the employees, a backlash from uh, uh, the, the health officials, a backlash from the occupational health and safety people that said you can't have a, um, you choose the size 800,000 person uh, facility um, and uh, get it down to a 200 and, and otherwise get it also locally owned outside my bandwidth a little bit. Okay, um, you talked a little bit about uh, onshoring in your presentation. Um, is that something that IEDC will look at in terms of what communities can do to prepare for onshoring or, or what, what would you suggest for communities um, that are interested in, first of all, it, will it happen? And then second of all, where, where's their place in something like that? So, will it happen? I hope so. I think so. But uh, we also haven't found the new normal yet, as we talked about that a, a, a little bit ago. Uh, there's a lot of resources out there uh, on reshoring. And, and IEDC, uh, at one point, and I don't know what the status of, had a reshoring website. Um, if you, uh, if you email D Crater, C R A T E R, that stands for Dana Crater at IEDC online.org. Uh, she uh, ran our reshoring efforts for us, and she can tell you uh, what tools that we still have available. There's uh, also a couple other organizations, the Reshoring Institute. Um, and there's another organization, just type in Google reshoring and you will find a, a variety of tools. As I indicated, I think the um, opportunities on reshoring are all about healthcare right now. We will be on the uh, edges on this issue. Um, I've also, I've been having a fair amount of conversation with uh, Senator Sherrod Brown's staff of Ohio. I, I happen to be from Ohio. And I believe they're gonna hold hearings on reshoring fairly quickly and it's gonna be 
reshoring of, of medical devices, uh, medical PPE, and maybe pharmaceuticals. For those of you who have been around a while may remember that the pharmaceutical industry used to be pretty much uh, centered around Puerto Rico. And they had a particular tax act, the 936 provision of the uh, tax code. And as long as that existed, you had lots of pharmaceutical manufacturers uh, making pharmaceuticals in Puerto Rico. Congress eliminated that subsidy or that uh, part of the tax code and they lost a lot of their pharmaceutical capacity. Uh, could they get it back uh, if uh, Congress re-implemented 936? Or could it be in Kansas? Or could it be in Wyoming, Ohio? Um, there, I think there's a real opportunity for us to bring that back. Uh, how many of the auto industry's uh, parts were interrupted uh, during this time period? They may decide that those parts can't be made uh, halfway around the world and need to be made here. And uh, I think it's to talk to your uh, uh, companies in your community and ask them where they impacted and do they think they can help convince somebody to, to locate back here. Oh, good talk. Um, do you think the remote work trend that you discussed a little bit earlier, potential uh, benefits communities in states like Kansas and, and how would we be able to take advantage of that? So the, the, the other thing that I didn't address um, is if you were living in New York City, because of the density, and I believe that's what they're gonna find, it was about density, you were more likely to get the coronavirus than if you were in a less dense place. Now, here's, here's the question. Will people in Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, you, you pick the big city, Houston, uh, Philadelphia, Will people either that have the ability to move to another place move? Um, will they in their retirement era uh, say, no, nope, we, we lived in the suburbs, we got our kids through school, we moved into the urban inner city because we wanted to go to the theaters and nice restaurants. The coronavirus is now scared the living bejesus out of us and we're gonna go live in a rural community. We're gonna wanna walk and we might wanna go to a place uh, like a college town that's gonna have amateur theater, it's gonna have uh, art exhibits of students and faculty, but you know maybe we ought to be living in some rural place. I think that's the advantage for a place like Kansas, Iowa, uh, that you have these uh, towns like Lawrence and Manhattan uh, that, uh, you know, have the, the uh, uh, intellectual capacity of a university, uh, but you're also small and you're, you're not likely to get a, a virus the way that New York City did. Okay. Um, you talked for a little bit about the um, C6 challenge, which you have a lot of people on this call, either staff for chambers and EDOs or, or board members. Uh, what can we do to help uh, facilitate uh, C6s being included either as allowable business in the, in the PPP or, or as you mentioned, uh, in some sort of a direct um, funding uh, like, like you talked about, you supported and IEDC supported? Yeah, uh, right now, um, focus on the C6, focus on the PPP, focus on your U.S. Senators. Um, every state has two of them. Um, I have seen a, I have seen a, a colleague letter from the Senators that uh, there's about 25, maybe pushing 30, that are on board and they're trying to convince their fellow Senators uh, to support uh, uh, the PPP for 501c6s. Um, I believe that once they get it through the Senate, uh, the only issue in the House would be if they don't include unions and, and um, they may, the, the compromise may be C6s and C5s. But at the end of the day, I think there's a path forward, but you know, you need to be communicating with your 
U.S. Senate delegation in a big way. Okay. Um, so last question, I guess, unless uh, uh, we have others, and I'll, I'll just ask this. And so let's let's put aside, at least to some degree, the the COVID discussion. You've been you've directed uh, IEDC and its predecessor for thirty years. Uh, talk a little bit about how economic development has changed and 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 what as communities we need to be thinking about um, in addition to the recovery what what are things that maybe are trends that we need to start thinking about well you know i i don't want to take you back to the dark ages um you know when i started i did drive to work in a, in a with a horse and buggy and, and used a buggy whip uh, no serious um the, 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 the changes in economic development have been pretty dramatic. We, you know, when I uh, first started um, with the Council for Urban Economic Development, which was the merger partner of the American Economic Development Council to form IEDC, um, economic development agencies were filling out paper forms when site selectors were interested in, in potentially uh, uh, looking at a site in your community, you sat there and you either typed in or hand wrote in a paper form and sent that information to the site selector. You know, you know we're being rejected um, as communities uh, without us even knowing it these days because there is so much data available to these site selectors that you don't know when you've been considered and when you haven't been considered. That's, uh, th that's a little bit of a problem uh, to uh, keep economic development viable in, in some places. Uh, but at the same token, we have more data available to us. We know the skill sets of our labor. And if, uh, if we can understand where that fits into the world and and which cluster industry clusters would be interested in the type of labor that we have in our community that puts us at a competitive advantage um, understanding um, you know what our competitor communities have and what we should have uh, to offset that is, uh, is much easier today than it was in the past. Um, there, we also, uh, you know, we, we have other technologies that allow us to communicate with social media um, in ways that didn't exist before. I mean, I, uh, I've used LinkedIn in a, a very aggressive ways uh, to help uh, put IEDC in a, in a different place in many of the minds of economic developers. In the same way, if I was working with site selectors or end users, you, you guys have the ability to do the same thing. You have the ability to get uh, in, into the, some of the groups where some of your target industries actually hang out. And those would all be things that, uh, uh, that didn't exist uh, in 1986 when I walked in the door at QED. You know, we didn't even have a a, a fax machine, and, and now most of uh, our members don't have fax machines. They scan something, they uh, and they send it by an email. There's been a lot of changes, and there'll be a lot more changes to come. Uh, at Jason, I, I appreciate uh, you and Molly uh, inviting me to join you guys today. Um, we'd like to think that IEDC has been uh, um, a valuable resource over the long haul, but I. I hope for those uh, communities that are struggling at this particular time that they're getting some solace out of that IEDC is a reasonably good partner and, and we're providing a ton of information to help people um, and get, get through this uh, cycle uh, effectively and smartly. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that. And, I'm, and, I, and I was joking earlier about uh, running an economic develop an organization with economic developers, but I think you kind of hit the highlight. I think when you get around that many people with that much passion, uh, it's it's hard to wrangle sometimes, and you and you get you get a lot of interesting conversations. But I know after uh, Hurricane Katrina, I was so proud to be part of IEDC and the efforts that that you made, and and a lot of the 
leadership and, and a lot of the members who went to Louisiana and, and Texas and other places on their own dime and, and helped people. And um, so I'm, I'm proud to be a member. Uh, I'm sure, and I know Jack has told me he is, I'm sure Molly is as well. So uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being part of our session today. Um, I do wanna mention to everyone on the call, we are working to reschedule Dr. Lee Norman. And so uh, we will get that information out to, to everybody um, when hopefully that gets done. And uh, we'll be looking for other opportunities as well. Hey, Jason, I, I forgot to mention one thing and I apologize for interrupting as, and I, you probably thought I was done and I thought I was done. This is Economic Development Week and we shouldn't forget that. And uh, I hope everybody is uh, reminding people in your community how uh, the things that you as economic developers do day in and day out to help make your communities better places. It's a time to pat yourself on the back it's a time to pat your employees, your, uh, remind your board members that uh, you guys are, are terribly important and, uh, and they, we shouldn't get lost. And, and it, this is that one week of the year, we get an opportunity to celebrate ourselves. Excuse me for, for getting that early on, Jason. No, thank you for mentioning that as well. And I know you were gracious to give me credit, but we all know that Molly Howie is the reason you're here today. And so I wanna thank Molly with Go Topeka uh, and then also, as, as always, thank our, our partners in Lawrence for uh, setting this up and, and letting us use their account. So with that, we will call it uh, uh, the end and, and we'll look forward to seeing everybody soon. So, and again, thanks, Jeff. You're welcome. Take care.